Hello, my name is Austin Belzer, and welcome back to the Austin B Media Podcast. Before we get into the main show, I have to tell you how you can support my work. The way I find my work, whether it be a review of a movie I rented or paying for Zoom, my Patreon is the way you can help offset those costs. Patrons like Ambula Bula, Brian Scuttle, David Walters, Joseph Davis of Sip Pop, Matthew Simpson of Awesome Friday, Tom Blackburn, and more help make episodes like this possible. So thank you to all of my lovely patrons out there. Beyond financial support, you can get some pretty sweet perks. Whether you're into 40-hour early access to my reviews and this podcast, monthly surveys, giving direct feedback, commentaries, and just about everything in between, consider becoming a patron for as little as $1 a month at patreon.com slash austinbmedia. You can also save 16% if you decide to subscribe annually. On top of that, if you're not ready to subscribe, you can get a seven-day free trial on every tier I offer. With that said, let's get to the show. Today, I will uh, will be discussing the first season of Gen V, which is a spinoff of The Boys. And today, I have Alicia Chavins uh, on to discuss. Sorry, I'm a little scattershot. I hear the leaf blower behind me, and I know it's not coming through, but it's just so distracting to me. But anyways, hi, welcome to the podcast. For those who haven't listened to our two Barbie podcast episodes. Um, Tell everyone about your work. Hi, I'm Elise Chaffins. I am a freelance writer for a newspaper here in Morgantown, West Virginia called Dominion Post. And I write on a Substack, MacGuffin, or Meaning, where I basically look at different movies and talk about the ways that they either work for me or not. I'm also working on a Ted Lasso book, looking at the relationships in that show. Yeah, so a little bit of everything going on. So then I've got to ask, this has happened since our last podcast recording. Are you going to watch the Hannah mm-hmm. Waddingham Christmas special? Oh, 100%. Yeah, definitely. I, oh, Hannah is just the best. So definitely I'll be there. <laughs> because I don't know if you've watched the trailer but it ends with all the cast of Ted Lasso coming up to hug her. Yeah. Oh, she is stunning. And I will, I, anything, I'm actually heading next weekend. So I don't know when that will be for everyone here. But the week before uh, Thanksgiving to see Roy Kent, Brett Goldstein in okay. his stand up. I'm super excited about it. So the second best night of my life, apparently. So we'll see. <laughs> is that the title of the stand up yeah which i think is phenomenal so i'm very excited about it <laughs> that's awesome so before we get to our discussion this is the drill is there any movie show album or anything else you want to uh, recommend before we get into this discussion i am super late to it by an entire year but i just watched fleischman is in trouble and it, oh my yeah. oh it just, it is sticking with me so much. Like I wrote about it last week and yeah, it's old. It was from last year, but it is spectacular. I adored every second of it. It is one of the best things I've seen in a while. So it's a real old recommendation, but yeah, definitely that. Yeah. And for those who, let's see, is, I I forget when the Emmys are. You've got a few months. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I think it's nominated in limited series. Yeah, limited series. I think Claire Danes is nominated, which, goodness, she was spectacular. So, yeah, like, it's really good. So, <laughs> I definitely recommend. In that same vein, I'm going to recommend something really quick in case I haven't already. I can't remember if I've recommended this, but I just recommended this to my grandma. There's a Jamie Foxx, Tommy Lee Jones movie called The Burial. Just came out on Prime Video about a month ago. Mm -hmm. A courtroom drama based on a true story. Tommy Lee Jones plays a funeral home director. Bad business deal. Brings on Jamie Foxx's character to kind of settle the whole thing. And... Yeah, it's just an old school courtroom drama. It's pretty much cut and dry from there. But yeah, I'd recommend it. I watched it at, I want to say 11 o'clock at night. 
<laughs> so that might have helped. But yeah. Well, I, I, I really... at 11 in the morning and it was still good then. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> no. Because there are some times where if you watch a movie so late, it does tend to be like, this is automatically better because I'm just in, you're in a state of mind, different state of mind. If you watch something at 11 o'clock versus 11 a.m. versus 11 p.m. So anyways, <laughs> uh, go check it out. It's on Prime Video. Fleshman is in Trouble is on Hulu. Um, Hulu, yeah. At least for now, until the Hulu brand gets absorbed into Disney Plus, and then it's all one app. Right. I think they're doing a, I think they talked about doing a beta the next month. Of okay. Incorporating Hulu into the Disney Plus app and then being rolled out next year. But that said, uh, let's talk Gen V. We have a lot to oh, talk about. So much. Um, and just heads up, we will uh, talk spoilers quite a bit, probably more than we actually will talk uh, spoiler-free, uh, because I think the spoiler discussion is going to be where it's the most interesting. Um, so. I'll have a timestamp in the recording um, for those who want, maybe want to just check out after this spoiler free discussion. Uh, but that's it. You've been warned. You'll be warned again before we go into spoiler free discussion, spoiler filled discussion, rather. Yeah. Police. The big question. So, this is a spinoff of the boys. The natural question is how did it compare to the boys? in tone and style. Um, yeah, how did it compare to the boys? So I went into this with very low expectations because spinoffs are just notoriously just super iffy. So I I was excited because I love the boys, but I was, I don't know, it'll be, we'll see what it does. Man, I loved it. I thought that it Same. hit what you expect from the boys without just being a carbon copy of the boys, which was, yes, yeah, super impressive to me. Like the way that it dealt with different issues were just really fantastic. I loved it. I thought tone wise, it's very in line with the boys. Like, I don't think you'll go into it and think, oh, this is totally outside of that like universe. No. But goodness. Yeah. No, I thought it was great. So yeah, I, yeah, <laughs> my low expectations were blown out of the water. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting because to give everyone a touchstone for this, and this is probably a less watched superhero show than Gen V, just because of where it's streaming. But it reminded me a lot at times of Doom Patrol. I could see that, yeah. And just it's not zany, but like how out there it is at times and how hyper real it is, is at times. But this is, to use a 90s reference, I think if The Boys was a goofy movie, this is an extremely goofy movie. There we go. Or, or, or I guess for Gen Z, what would be the analogous? This, if The Boys was... Twi Twilight, this is Breaking Dawn. <laughs> there, there you go. I think I've got all four quadrants there. But but yeah, it, it basically for me is a college version of, of the boys in many aspects. Because it's just like, hey, what do these soups who are learning to be soups, what do they deal with? What's the beginnings of what a soup? is growing up uh it, like what is the soup version of well what's a famous college like harvard yeah that's what what i find it analogous to what are the social issues that at that they think is important what just what generally happens at a soup focused university but yeah and i guess with that Let's get into overall thoughts on mm -hmm. it. Did you feel like it did enough to, I, I guess, stand out on its own and then also try to 
yeah, did, did it stand on its own? And then how does it work as that standalone, as well as a spinoff? I, I think it's maybe a little tougher as a standalone. I think if you haven't watched The Boys, it might be a little bit of a hard sell to come into it without that background, just because of some of the cameos that happen throughout the show. We'll get into that. Yeah, exactly. But I just, I feel like without the context of the boys, it might be a little bit tough to get into Gen V. I can't imagine there were a ton of people watching who aren't already fans of the boys. I don't know any of those metrics or anything, but I expect it's largely the same audience. So yeah, as far as that goes, I don't know that you could come into Gen V without it. I suppose you could, but I think it would be tough. I'll be honest. Yeah, it'd be pretty tough because, and this isn't spoilers, but I think it even opens with the Vought News Network like thing of here's very specific things that happened in The Voice season three. Yeah. (laughs) But I think in terms of your question of overlap, I think the boys has like probably my demographic, like probably, I don't know, 24 to 35, somewhere around there. Whereas I think Gen V will, and I'll be interested to see the stats if they release, if Amazon releases them. Mm -hmm. But I think Gen V, I think it'll tend to skew towards Gen Z uh, naturally because I I think it's trying to, there are moments in this show where it's very clearly trying to say, hey, Gen Z, that problem you deal with in real life, here's how soups deal with it. (laughs) That's, That's... one, I guess with that question answered, a big part of this is this show is character focused. I guess what characters did you find the most interesting or compelling in the show? I really liked Emma. I thought she was an interesting character. As somebody who's not like main, main, one of the more supporting characters, I just found her story really fascinating. I think she's just... She's somebody, I'll be, again, I don't want to get into spoilers quite yet. So I'll talk more about some of her, some of the thoughts about her in a minute, but I really liked her and Sam, of course, was fantastic. So I think they were probably two of my favorites. Very interested to see where things go as things were left at the end of the season. I'll be very anxious to see what happens with both of them because they both had some really interesting character arcs through the seasons yeah yeah i very specifically want to talk about a specific moment with emma in spoilers okay <laughs> uh, because i somebody brought something up that was like oh that's really interesting yeah <laughs> so anyways yeah i really liked i think i liked it's a tie for me between either sam and you hear that? Mm-mm. <laughs> no. Okay. All right. Because I thought he opened the door with the leaf blower. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Anyways. There we go. But yeah, I thought the two, it, it's neck and neck for me. I think either Sam or, oh, gosh, Jordan. Is that his name? Mm. Or is that their Jordan's name? Like, yeah. Because I thought the whole concept of the power of being able to switch genders on the fly, and obviously there's meta commentary on the transgender experience on, yeah, we'll get into that. Spoilers. Um, That's like, this section has to be real short so we get to the spoilers. But one character I thought that she's on like front and center in the poster. She's supposed to be like the main character in the show is Marie. I didn't really think she did a good job and not because of her acting. I just think 
the story really doesn't serve her all that well because we're supposed to be this emotionally invested, but then we're like split between five other characters. So then it becomes like this whole thing. So yeah, I, I would have loved to, and maybe this happens in season two a bit more because of what happens at the end of season one. Maybe we'll get a bit more time with her and I hope we do because I think she had real potential to be like the big, thing but yeah we'll talk about all these people in spoilers but we got a lot to talk about spoilers yeah (laughs) and i guess without with dodging spoilers um what do you think about the conceit of the show setting up a mystery at the center of the show and was that like an effective way to keep you uh coming back week after week or was it something else that maybe kept you coming back yeah I'll say that I was a lot more interested in what was happening with the characters than with the mystery the mystery has a lot of implications for season four of the boys (laughs) like massive implications for that so it's not that I wasn't interested in it but I wasn't interested in it as much for Gen V as I am for what's coming in the next season of The Boys. So I think that's where, again, like I think that's what like hurts it in terms of being a standalone kind of event is that one of the big parts of it really, I don't think has as much implication for the show itself. It does. It's not that it doesn't have any because it deals with, why are they at God you in the first place? But other than that, it's a lot more to do with the larger picture of the boys universe. And so to me, it was maybe less effective there, but I'm still very excited about it. (laughs) Yeah. I think who's the showrunner, Eric Kripke. Mm, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. He described it as Gen V season one hands off to boy season four. And the boys season four hands off to Gen V season two, which will then right. head right. off into season five of the boys, so on and so forth. Yeah, I think I saw yesterday that the boys season four is supposed to start basically about a month after in the timeline, about a month after the events of the end of Gen V. Yeah. Yeah, there's so. like a specific list Kripke tweeted yeah. out or X'd out or posted yeah. out, uh, <laughs> whatever it's called this week. <laughs> but I think as to the mystery of the show, I didn't need it. I, I think, and maybe we'll talk about this a bit more in spoilers, but I think it felt like a lot of what Marvel's been doing lately. And mm-hmm. I know people are criticizing Marvel lately. I get it. But this is actually a valid criticism. I think there's a lot of key jangling that happens in Gen V. That's, hey, yeah. look at this thing. It's going to set up season four of The Boys. Look at this, look at these keys. And I just didn't need that from a show that also tries to be a standalone story. And for a story that's trying to be so different from The Boys, yes, it's set in that same universe, but it's trying to be, like like I said earlier, the Gen, v, Gen Z version of The Boys, where it's like tackling social issues and meta commentary of everything else so yeah i i just think i could have gone without that and i hope that they maybe lessen that a little bit in season two because there was a point where in gen v where i was like i don't know if i need this thing to happen but we'll talk about that in spoilers But I guess we've been dancing around it. How how do you think it handled all the uh, political and social issues that it brings up? Yeah, I think it did them justice. I thought it was pretty good. Like when I watch The Boys, it seems to have a larger, it, it seems to tackle maybe like larger, like more system kind of things so obviously it starts out the voice starts out as just a commentary on superheroes in general and probably the police state to some degree just like how if you have this unlimited power 
and everything, how is that going to affect you? But really, <laughs> like, maybe people are not, like, generally, the more power people have doesn't make them better people. And like, maybe the way we look at superheroes is wrong. <laughs> and so I thought that was, so that's what the boys does. And then it dealt more, I think, in especially season three with, Paul, season two, too, but two and three a lot with, like, politics, particularly American politics, but I think global politics in general, too. But this kind of went to some of the smaller issues. So like self-harm kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. like you mentioned earlier, like transgender identity issues and stuff like that. So I thought that was interesting the way it focused maybe on stuff that I do think is maybe of like more concern to like Gen Z in general. So I think that, and I think the way they handled it was pretty good. It's real broad strokes in the boys and it's pretty broad strokes in Gen V as well. So I don't want to be like, it's a super nuanced whatever, but there were a couple of really good scenes. I particularly, there's a scene with like when the parents come and you meet a bunch of parents yeah. with the soups and like, that to me was probably one of the most effective scenes in terms of dealing with that. I thought that was really good. I will definitely talk about that a lot, especially with Emma, because I felt like that was the big place with her. But yeah, that was, so yeah, I think it did it well, maybe not with the most nuance, but overall, I thought it was pretty, pretty good. Yeah, there were specific moments where I'm like, I, okay, I understand that you're trying to make a commentary on these issues where you're doing it in a kind of roundabout way that seems a little obvious. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. When, like when Marie and Emma meet for the first time, and this isn't spoilers, I'm not going to mention anything that's even remotely spoilers. Um, mm -hmm. it, she mentions, hey, why can't I open this window? And then, she, oh, it's, I think she says it's for our, uh, their safety or our safety or something like that. Because right. I, I think they mention like people jump out or whatever, stuff like that. Right. They allude to like suicide uh, a, a lot, um, and uh, yeah, there, yeah, <laughs> it 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 felt very okay. I get it, but you didn't have to be like that direct with it. Or right. and like another example was when a specific moment happens, there is this. Um, a lot of the Godu students view the world through the eyes of social media. Uh, and, and there's a scene where this uh, uh, I the stretchy arm girl yeah the, where she's like fake crying and then as soon as she like finishes the video it she uh, switches back to like just being like oh okay I'm gonna go edit it and there are a lot of those moments where I'm like I feel and I don't know if I hope that in maybe a second season that for those moments, I hope they get somebody on the writing team that maybe is of younger. I, I don't know how you could get a Gen Z person on the writing staff, but that would be nice because it, yeah. it, it definitely felt like a, hey, look at this social issue. And that's not necessarily bad. It just felt like they didn't understand the heart of the some of these issues. Um, yeah. and instead just said, Hey, here's this thing. Okay. Now we're going to move on. Yeah. Uh, no, um, I agree. But, uh, with that said, let's see, um, what would you like to see in a second season? Oh gosh. I would like them. I'll be anxious to see what happens at the end of the season. There are basically two factions that kind of happen. I'll be really anxious to see how that plays out, like what that looks like, because I think one of the things that I notice, I have six <laughs> Gen Z kids, yeah, so it's a blended family, but what I notice is that there tend to be a fair number of extremes, I would say, in Gen Z. And I don't think that's even necessarily a bad thing, but I think they tend to have, and I think some of that is just the age in general. I think you ha tend to have more 
I don't know, strong views with maybe a little, I don't want to say less nuance. I don't want to sound like old lady screeching at the young people these days. But I do think just generally, I may think about to myself when I was in my mid twenties, my views were a lot more black and white because I just hadn't, I had, I'm not a kid. I'm an adult. I have adult thoughts about things, but I also don't have a ton of experience in the world because I'm in my mid twenties. That is different as I approach 50. Like it's just a different kind of thing. So I don't say that to be negative. I love Gen Z. They are super fun. But also I think we do have these fairly extreme kind of sides in this. And I think that is representative of Gen Z in Gen V. And so I think that they did that pretty well. And I'll be anxious to see how that goes because you do see the beginnings of looking at nuanced kind of ways of, oh, okay, yeah, you're right, but also maybe not. So I'll be anxious to see how they follow up with that. I think it can be really interesting. Yeah, the hard thing with this show is just it's because it's so woven in with the boys. I feel like it's hard to know what I want from season two when we have the whole basically extra season of TV that I think is going to shift how I might feel about that. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And we probably won't get Gen V till season two till yeah. 2026. Probably. Yeah, that would be my guess. Yeah. Because the boys season four is some nebulous 2024 date as was revealed yesterday. And yeah, I don't see it taking less than two years to. Yeah. Same. I don't think so either. So I don't know. We'll see. But the two factions are probably the part that will continue into season two. And so I guess that in terms of the story there, that's what I'm most anxious to see. That and to see what Marie's deal is, because there is a very powerful soup and I'll be real anxious to see what they do with her. And like you, I felt like she got the short shrift on season one. So I'll be anxious to see what they do with her. Yeah. And what would I like to see in season two? I, I really don't know because of how season one ends. Yeah. I, I think depending on how season four, the boys end, I think that will, that will inform me on what I would want. But honestly, I'd rather, I guess I said it earlier, I would like to see less key jangling, mm-hmm. less cameos. I don't need it. I don't need it to necessarily tie all the way into the boys i can just have it i'm okay with it just being something where oh hey here's bot news network or here's one of the seven or something like that i I, i'm fine with just little things where it's oh yeah this is the boys got it um yeah, a lot more with the background stuff. Like I loved all of the posters and drinking the A train beverage or whatever. So like they did a lot of those kind of things that I'm super here for. Like little Easter eggs like that. Yeah, give me all of those. That's fine. But yeah, in terms of cameos and like really direct tie-ins, eh, I don't need that either. Yeah. With that said, what's well, let's see, what what are our final thoughts and ratings for this season? That's good. If you like the boys, it's impossible for me to imagine you not enjoying this show, like Gen V. I I can't see how it doesn't work for you, but yeah. I will say I I do not think that is the case. I think because of how college focused it is limiting in that aspect because I because for those who haven't watched this season which why are you listening to us if you haven't watched the season but do it do whatever you want <laughs> I think it's even more graphic at times than the boys and I think oh yeah <laughs> that they replay and replay <laughs> yeah and, and I'm just like okay there there might be some I know who made just be like, eh, I'll just watch The Boys. And I'm sure there's like a pipeline where you can watch The Boys by itself and or and watch Gen V by itself. But I don't think for much. I, I think after the season, Gen V is going to be even closer knit. But I have some theories about that that we'll talk about in spoilers. Final rating for me is probably a four. That would or, be my thought. 
yeah, like four ish. So, yeah. Out of five, by the way. Not yeah. out of ten. <laughs> it just there are I would do five out of five, but there's some moments where I feel it really just falls apart. Mm-hmm. Especially around, and this isn't spoiling anything. I think about the halfway point, it is when you're like, oh, got it. Like with Ahsoka, there's like a certain moment that happens where you're like, okay, now it's, now this is the show I want to watch. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like the the main reason I wouldn't give it five is just because it does rely, in my mind, pretty heavily on the boys. And if a show is its own show and not part of another thing, then I feel like it needs to be its own thing. And because this is only on the outer edges of being its own thing. That's the big reason why I would give it four rather than a higher rating, but, but it's a pretty good four. <laughs> yeah. It's like a solid four for me. Yeah. It's all four for me. <laughs> and I would personally say it's a real good season, like three B. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it really is. Cause I, mean, I had some issues with season three of the boys, particularly at the end. Uh, and this cleaned away a lot of that for me. <laughs> yeah, it really did. But, but with that said, uh, let's get into our spoiler discussion. If yeah. you have not watched the entire season, and I do mean the entire season, um, what is it, nine episodes? Eight? eight if nine? Had, yeah, eight, eight um, or nine, yeah. Yeah, if you haven't, like, if you haven't watched all of Gen V season one, yeah, turn back now because we are going to talk about everything, like literally everything. Okay, maybe not literally everything. We're not going to talk about <laughs> what brand of blankets does a uh, right. <laughs> clarity use, but but we're going to get it pretty in depth. So turn back now. This is your final warning. Yeah. All right, still here. Cool. First, what was your favorite reveal of the season? Oh my gosh. Favorite reveal. I guess the end where Emma is small with vomiting is really, that feels important to me because of just the way her character is and because of the way they deal with it. So throughout the whole season, she throws up in order to get small. And she only gets small for like all of the past prior to being at God You. And then when, as far as I know, anyway, I don't think she knew that she could get big. And there's a scene where she gets big, like she eats and becomes giant Emma, which is awesome. It's so great. And that's part of why I love her character is like, And so a lot of it's tied to eating disorders is the way it's framed, I think, is, oh, here's somebody and you have this eating disorder and that's your superpower. And I really loved the way that the show dealt with, here's this problem that you have and you talk about it in terms of your superpower. And so Marie with cutting herself, so you have that kind of self harm. you have Emma with, you know, purging to get small and so many of their powers are tied to some kind of negative behavior but that's what also makes them special and I just thought that was a really interesting kind of way to tie those two things together but Emma at the end of the finale is small without purging and so then there's this moment of oh is Emma a character who's maybe emotions are what make her big or small and the way that she feels. So when she purges, she feels bad and that makes her small. When she's like able to eat what she wants, she feels more powerful and bigger. And so I'm very excited to see what they do with her because that felt massive to me, especially with her mom and the way that her mom is like, oh, are you like writing down every single thing that you eat so that you're not too big or you're not too small? Are you like keeping track? And so she has this real like stage manager mom. And mm, I just, oh, I'm so excited to see what happens with her. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, you're good. What's interesting about that reveal with Emma, I think, is it didn't click for me what why 
that it could have been her powers could be emotion driven right. until I watched a I always watch the screen crust things. Oh, Ryan they, Aries, so great. <laughs> they always know more than me because they actually read the comics. And sometimes I'm like, ah, I don't know if I want to devote an entire month to just reading all, all the Gen V stuff, especially since well, I think a lot of these characters are new to the, these don't haven't existed in the boys universe because they do have Gen V like they have the G men in the boys comic books, but it's entirely different. But it didn't click for me that as an emotion face until I watched the video talking about the finale. And I was like, oh, that makes a lot more sense because you played a specific clip of her of e eating a lot to get big. And oh, so yeah, that makes a lot more sense. So she would feel powerful because of all the nutrients of e eating a lot. Um, but what if it's just oh, I, I feel powerful because now I can just not have to worry about what uh, anyone else thinks. Exactly. Yeah, like I said, particularly with her mom, which is why that episode is probably one of my favorites, the one with the parents coming in. I just thought it was the one that was really solid. Yeah. And the absence of Marie's parents, because obviously- And Kate's parents, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, just hits harder because they're just like, wandering around they're like and they connect over that lack of parent parenthood which is interesting for how the season ends up yeah um, and what she makes marie go through yeah with the shetty so yeah um, oh my gosh oh my god that's probably more messed up that moment is probably more messed up than anything the boys has ever done and uh, including yeah. the octopus thing Timothy is Which gone one? too soon. But yeah, jokes aside, yeah, I really like that episode too, the parents episode. But yeah, yeah. Let's see. I really like that. Let's see. Where do I want to go from here? Let's see. What else did you mention? You if we're talking about parents, I feel like that's a good place to like segue into Kate because I think okay. Kate's extended family really impacts the way that maybe even more than Marie it does. But I felt, I think that was the interesting thing. And maybe where Marie was tough for me this season is I felt like Kate's whole story felt so much more impactful. Like Marie accidentally killing her parents and then her sister saying, no, I don't want you around. I don't want to mm -hmm. be with you because you did this on purpose or whatever. That is a compelling story for sure. I don't want to pretend like it's not, but I feel like Kate's story of no, her parents keep her around, but they're locking her in her room behind this massive steel door. Yeah, thick steel door. They won't touch her at all because of what she did to her brother. Her tormentors are there with her every single day. That is horrifying. And to me, that is so much worse than Marie's story. Even though Marie's is worse, because I guess technically because her parents are dead. I don't know. There's something to me that's, I think because so many people have this really strained relationship with parents, that like, I think just hits better. So I felt like, I think that kind of wiped out a lot of Marie's story because to me, like Kate's just works in a way that I think more people can relate to. Most people don't accidentally murder their parents but a lot of people have really strained relationships with their parents because of you know who they are and mm -hmm. so to me that just made her story so much more compelling and they have these similar arcs but like to me Kate's is just so much stronger and so yeah like Kate's story is just fantastic to me I like I oh yeah I really Hard for me to pick a favorite because they're all so good. <laughs> yeah, and can I make a bold prediction for season two of Gen V? Mm, go. I think Marie actually doesn't care whether she reconnects with her sister. I get that vibe very strongly because even though she's like really emotional anytime they flash back to it, 
I, I, I don't feel like Marie herself, I feel like it's a lie she told herself that she wants to be that n- not seen as a monster. I think it's actually something where she's, no, because I had a traumatic memory, this will make it better. And she mm-hmm. sold herself on that lie because we see where she grows up and maybe that's a lie she told herself to make it through the system mm-hmm. and get to God you. I could see that. Yeah, I could definitely see that. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, with, uh, gosh, who else? Let's see. Do, do we want to talk about Sam or, or Andre or Jordan next? I mean, we can certainly talk about Jordan because I think they're an interesting character. I loved, you know, casting. I love that on the poster you have both. Mm-hmm like versions of Jordan. I thought that was really neat. I dug that. I thought that they handled Jordan's story really well. I thought I particularly liked the scene after Marie and Jordan hook up. And then Jordan's mad because Marie freaked out when she woke up and Jordan was in their female body at that time and I think was it were they talking with Kate maybe I can't remember who Jordan was talking to but they said something along the lines of oh this all freaked out and Kate I think it was Kate but I I truly don't remember it was like yeah but you went to bed with her as a dude and so that was your thing you didn't think that she'd hook up with you unless you were a guy and i just thought that was really interesting it wasn't it was a translucent son he was talking to oh okay okay i forget his name glasses boy Uh, i don't know yeah m something or other i can't remember okay a ta i'll just call him (laughs) (laughs) but i thought that was really interesting that idea of like gender and sexuality and the way that they differentiated with that. I thought that was really cool. And so I like that. And then I just, I have transgender kids. And so this is like a topic that's of importance to me. And so I thought that the discussion with the parents was really interesting as well with Jordan of your parents accept you, but not really. And that is always one of the saddest things to me is people who have that kind of like half measure of acceptance. And so I thought that was really interesting as well of, yeah, it's fine, but I'm going to still call you the pronoun that's more comfortable for me or whatever. And I thought they did that. It's a little on the nose, but without being like gross about it. I don't know. It felt good. And it was easy. I thought they took a little more risk there to have parents who are like ish supportive rather than parents who just kicked them out, which is expect it to go and so I thought it was interesting to have this kind of like middling place because I think that's where a lot of people end up is with parents who don't kick them to the curb but also aren't going to respect them in any kind of like genuine way and so I thought that was interesting yeah and Marie even brings up not in regards to the parents she has a line of stop switching to a man when you want to make a point which I thought was good because I, I think it that line illustrated the whole internal struggle with Jordan of, oh, I, I want to use these gender norms for my benefit so I can get into what the top 10 was top 10, top five or something like right. that. Because at every moment in the season, oh, I just wanted, I just did this because I want to get in the top 10 or whatever. Like even doing some pretty things pretty morally questionable things to get into the top 10 right let's see i do want to talk about actually one second i will be right back i gotta do a bio break yeah totally so sorry i'm gonna hit pause cool i'll be right back with that i want to talk about andre and his relationship with his dad specifically a reveal that happens pretty late in the season i think it's in the final episode i think that flaherty has a seizure on screen when being interviewed with by the guy from bot news like something cameron 
Yeah. Cameron Crank Cameron or something. Cam Cameron or something like that. Something like uh, that. <laughs> it, it, it's alliterative or something like that. And then Andre's kind of pushed off to the side to where he's separated from all, all of the other, like from Marie, everyone, and is just in Seven Tower with his dad. And then learns that he his dad's like seizure was caused by his powers, which was interesting. I'll say as somebody who has epilepsy, wasn't a big fan of that whole thing, but I understand it. Brain damage can cause seizures, but I was a little bit like, okay, he could have, I don't know. I feel like that could have been tweaked a little bit more to be something where, oh, maybe, I, I don't know. Maybe you couldn't have a, a, a thing where he, he's dying and you, I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It was just a thing where I was like, okay, it, it probably doesn't do well for uh, epilepsy's image to have, such a spectacle out of it. Um, anyways, that aside, personal feelings and stuff. And then he hands down his suit to Andre. He's like, I've got to get it fitted. And it it's the sins of the father, right? It's that classic thing. And I'll be really interested to see where they go with it. It, it, it depends. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, I, I just thought that, uh, I wanted to mention that really quick because I thought that was, what they did with him was actually really cool. Um, and we'll get to Sam here soon. Yeah. Um, but next I want to talk about the death of Golden Boy. Yeah, that was a shocker. Uh, yeah. Like, it's the first big... The Boys is full of WTF moments and things like that. But with Gen V, you're, like, looking for it. But then... When the death happens, you're like, oh, wait a minute. This is an entirely different thing. In episode one. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, and it starts like the whole narrative of controlling the narrative of the whole Guardians of Godolkin thing, which. Let me ask you, did you feel like that was a reference like Guardians of the Galaxy or was that just me? Probably a little bit. I don't know. It's hard to it's hard to know on that one. And <laughs> but okay. the seven is feels very Justice, Justice League. leaguey. Yeah. So and the, yeah, to pull a Guardians of the Galaxy doesn't that, that makes sense to do that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it, it was very interesting, I think, the Golden Boy death. Because I think but because what's interesting about it is Golden Boy keep showing up throughout the season through either Sam or other people's memories of him and interacts physically with people. Not, not, I guess not unlike a force ghost uh, from Star Wars, but, but I thought that was really well, really well done because I think it can, I think it directly confronted the stuff that, that happens later on in the season with him. I think directly confronts audience assumptions about what can a person do once they're dead in this universe? What is that? And it just flips it on his head, which I really appreciated. Definitely. But I feel like we talked about it more than the show, so we'll just move on <laughs> uh, to Rufus. I just want to mention Rufus really quick. Oh, my God. I feel so bad for this man. I feel bad for him exactly, but my goodness, we reveled in his his misery every, at the beginning of every single episode, I think, after it happened. Because let's run through what happens. And maybe feel bad is probably not the best term to use, give, considering who he is and what he does. But, like, he hits himself in the junk with a baseball bat repeatedly. Right. Because Kate tells him to, which honestly should be our first clue that maybe Kate isn't the person she thinks she is. Right. Um, <laughs> and then gets his, that, that same area exploded. Oh, um, that was horrifying. Oh my God. Even more than the termite cocaine thing from last season. Oh, of the I said that. Yeah. Because that was like gross, but this was like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I 
Does he die? Does Rufus die? I don't think so. He, the one character comes up, he's filming something in his Homelander red hat. And the one character from the woods, and we'll get it, like, I don't know that he's a named character. But anyway, he comes up, probably is, but I definitely don't remember. But he comes up and he asks, are you a soup? And he says, yeah. And then he goes on and he finds the professor who is not a soup and melts her face off. I Which was, don't... I... oh, that, yeah. mo- that, that moment. Finale. I want to talk about the finale because okay. good night. That was oh, something. Um, but anyway, like, I don't think Rufus dies in that. I think he still exists okay. um, after that. There was a lot of mayhem, so I don't know, but I'm fairly certain he survived. But goodness, yeah, like, he goes through some stuff, but he's also a fascist, so I'm okay. (laughs) Yeah, I I will say I do like that the show gave him a moment to be like, hey, even though I've done all these terrible things and probably am a terrible person, because, yeah, we'll get to him later when we talk about Sam a bit more. Um, but, like, it, I like that they gave him a moment to be like, hey, I may have done evil things, but I didn't wipe your mind. So that was a nice little moment. But anyways, we'll talk about R- Rufus probably more in season two. Come back next Absolutely. in 2023. Yeah. <laughs> With that said, let's talk about the West. All of it. Yeah. The um, is the part that to me felt the most superfluous, I feel. Yeah. It's both essential and not at all. It's, yeah. It's the one star off also kind of part of it to me. Yeah. Yeah, this is where I really felt like the most key jangly of moments. Yeah, um, Where, because every time they go to the woods, which is a lab where they're perfecting a compound V virus. Or I forget, Dr. Cardoza, is that his name? Cardoza, yeah, I think so. Yeah. He's perfecting it to make soup sick and possibly control soups and Dean Shetty's like behind it all and all that stuff. I felt like that was the most like out of character for the show moment because yeah. it's okay. Like as soon as they flash to it, I'm like, oh, this is the boy season four. Got it. Especially in the final moments with Dr. Cardoza. Yeah. With the handoff. But yeah, I yeah, I feel like I and I hope, I guess the woods are gone. Question I mean, I mark. So. Yeah. They because <laughs> but your nose about the virus it seems in that yeah Kripke did confirm that he knows yeah I assume that he knows and the woods served its purpose it made the virus and yeah I don't know it just it was the least effective part of the season for me but it also like I said it's the part that season four four a of the boys like that's like that's where it is and like that yeah like I don't know How you use Sam very well. I guess that's where, if they were doing something like this, uh, what's the name of the facility that um, Stormfront went to? Whatever. The place. Red River? Yeah, something. I think that's it. Yeah. I just feel like we already have that in the boys. So you saying basically almost exactly the same thing. It just felt redundant in a not good way. I, yeah, that was my thing. I just wish there was some way they could have done something with Sam without having, yeah, basically this like we lock up soups or we are experimenting on soups kind of thing. I just, it just didn't, yeah, it didn't work for me. Great. Yeah, and I think it lessens the stuff with Sam because it's like, okay, we already know that there's things like this that exist somewhere else Um, because, um, what was it in the, um, was it the orphanage that uh, Marie's at? They tell him, like, 
you don't want to go to Red River. And okay, so they set up that you don't want to go there, and then right. they bring up the woods, and you don't want to go there. So again, like you said, it's really redundant because we already have these places in universe. And I, you know what? I wonder if Eric Kripke was like, who I think did he write the? Yeah, I think he was one of the writers on the like the comic even. Okay. Like, I believe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. We don't read all the comics. I don't read the comics. <laughs> Especially ones that, like, are at the time. Because let's be honest. The boys at the time, yes, it had a claim. But nobody was like, oh, you need to read this in the same capacity that they are now. But But I think it might have been one of those things where Eric was like, hey, we need to have the woods because I it's something from the comic books or something like that. And it, it serves this specific story purpose and maybe it has even more of a purpose in season two, three, and so on. I don't think so, but I could see it being one of those the immovable lore things. Five Nights at Freddy's. Go check out my review. <laughs> oh, and Elise, oh, you yeah. reviewed it too where I think he might have just said, this is my non-negotiable for this show. It needs to have this and this. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Um, it just, I don't know. It didn't work for me. <laughs> yeah. Great. I just feel like there could have been some way, yeah, to do that without, yeah. It just felt a little, that feels MacGuffin-y to me. <laughs> it just is like, it's not the meaning side. It's the MacGuffin side. It just didn't really have any, like it existed for the plot to happen rather than having any kind of like value in and of itself. That's my basic thought on it. Yeah. It's an infinity stone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But with that, we've been dancing around Sam. So let's yeah. talk about Sam. Let's just leave it open and let's just talk about Sam. What did you think of him? What did you think of where his arc ends up? All of it. Let's talk all of it. Yeah. Sam is a great character. Like, he is really interesting. I'll be very interested to see with him and Kate at the end of the season being lauded as the new Guardians of Godolkin. I'll be really anxious to see. But, like, here's this kid who's taken away from his brother and obviously has, like, mental issues. And it looks like he was at Red River. Is that like when it starts and then gets moved to the woods, I guess I was a little, I think so, but I think that's the story is that he's sent there and then gets moved to the school and without golden boy knowing this is that this happened without Luke knowing. And I think that is, yeah. So you have this tragic person, the scene with him and the puppets is one of the best scenes just I've seen in a while. It's phenomenal. Just in terms of something to watch, the whole scene where he just mows down this entire team of whatever bought people there to get him, but in puppet form is stunning. I adored it. I loved it so much. And it's also funny too, because yeah. there there's a moment where it's, I have a wife and kids and the usual yeah. feel. And then he feeds him his arm or something like that. It's like the most gruesome scene that they've ever had on anything. But it's all puppets, so it's not... Mm, I just thought, for a show that does not shy away from violence and just intense gore, to take a scene that would be probably the bloodiest, most horrific scene in all of the show and take it all and do it on puppets is just... Mm, Mm, so good. I loved it. I loved it. I thought it was just perfect. Perfect scene. <laughs> yeah, and I, uh, I I appreciated how, and maybe you didn't have this thing, but you, I have a, a moment until they confirmed it, like the next episode. I was like, did that really happen? Yeah. And then they talk about it next episode with Emma, and I'm like, oh, okay, that did happen, because given Sam's mental state, Cast, cast aspersions on, okay, is what's going on actually real? Because he sees TV's Jason Ritter and a puppet version of The Deep and things like that on TV. And 
But I thought his, I, I think his storyline was really well done. And I think him joining Kate, while a little bit, I think, rushed, I think it made sense that this illusion meant to, oh, I can be this way and I am this way because I am, it speaks to all sorts of things that have been happening politically yeah. in real life. So I, I thought it was a, a really nice handling of that, even more so than what's even happening on the boys itself. Yeah, because he goes, and I thought that was the interesting thing, is that he goes and he has this day. He gets with Emma and they have their scene together and they hook up. And then she takes him, but she does the same thing a little bit that has happened to him his whole life, which is you have to hide here. You have to stay in this yeah. room. Don't interact with anybody. And even though I think she loves him and she's not doing this, I could see how in his mind it's, oh, I'm just being isolated again. I'm just, somebody else is trying to control me. And here comes Rufus and like he steps outside and they're doing this like sledding thing and it's super fun and he could go and he can just be a regular person. That's after it's this random person like where just, this yeah. yeah Rufus grabs him and takes him to the mm -hmm. after party thing. But I loved that thing where it's oh here you belong in this group and now here we want you to continue to belong so come over here and join this and yeah somebody who's been yeah isolated for their whole life they've never really had anything anybody close to them to have this whole group that's we accept you and we want you to be a part of this to me, his arc makes sense. I'm sad. I don't want Sam red pilled, but I'm I see it. I think it's really good. And I think it speaks to so many people who do end up in these really like extremist kind of views. Is it's a lot of isolation. And then you go and here's this group and they're ready to accept you. That works. That happens in real life to lots of people. And having Sam go down that route is sad to me it's not where i want him but i thought it was really good i made sense it felt story-wise really true yeah and you just made me think of a theory that somebody had about sam in the boys universe so somebody said because there's been images that le have leaked from season four of the boys and there's black noir and for anyone who knows Black Noir is very much dead. So I think this kind of plays into the theory that Sam becomes Black Noir. Yeah, I um, totally see that. Because then he'll have that sense of belonging with Homelander and like always wanting to do what he says and but also not wanting to be controlled in that same way. It, it'll be like a delicate balance that I think will be worked out in season four and Probably, I, I hate to say it, but I think Sam isn't make, making it a past season four of the boys. Maybe. I I do. The only thing I could see, because I've seen the theory floated of him being the new Black Noir. The only, like, potential issue I could see with that is there's the unmasked picture of him at the end. It's him and Kate at the mm -hmm. end of the news program. And so I'm not entirely sure how you navigate that. Like, how do you get rid of him? Because nobody knows, as far as I know, nobody knows that Black Noir is dead. We know, but the exactly. world does not know, right? Yeah. No, I think they say it's like missing or something like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. I don't know if you kill Black Noir and then we're going to use his suit with Sam. I'm not entirely sure, which they could definitely do that. But that's the only fly in the ointment i can see with sam being black noir but yeah that feels pretty real to me <laughs> yeah yeah but, and go ahead no you go ahead because let's face it uh uh kate's not joining the seven with the half arm yeah no i can't see that because we saw how homelander looks at people last uh, season they tried to recruit a blind superhero or i believe that's the correct term yeah and, 
and he just claps his ears in to yeah. So huh. half an arm, maybe he's not as forgiving now as he was in season three, maybe. Yeah. Um I don't know. <laughs> um but anyways, um that actually leads me into another theory I have for but not for the boys. Mm -hmm. Um I have a theory for Gen V season two. What do you do with the soups who have escaped the woods? I don't know. A lot of them look like they were mowed down uh, just in the. Oh, yeah. OK. That, so that... I think a lot of them are dead. <laughs> OK. Then that, so I, I... Like we have to talk about that whole finale, yeah, which let's do is. It a deeply upsetting finale for kids who have had the threat. I think about, I grew up prior to Columbine, like that happened right as I was graduating college. And so, but there are so many people who their whole life is, has been under the threat of school shootings to have that much violence on a, like school ground was it's an upsetting finale. <laughs> they put a warning at the beginning of the episode. Oh, that did it's they? Going to deal with that. Yeah. Oh, that it, I didn't get that. A school, a school setting. Yeah, which I think is good because it's upsetting and very like chaotic. It's a short episode, like of all. I think it's the shortest of the season. I'm not a hundred percent on that, but I'm fairly certain because I was shocked that it was over as soon as it was. But yeah, to have that much, I thought it was just, oh, it's really upsetting. Episode but, six is the shortest one. Okay. But it's done so, so well. Oh, I'm like, sorry. You're right. You're right. Yeah. I, I was like, it's, it's one of the shortest for sure. Because I think it's like just shy of 40 minutes or something or right at 40 minutes. and 39 is what it yeah. says. And then the Jumanji episode is 40. There we go. Yeah, they're real close, but oh my goodness. And it, yeah, it was just, it was really, oh, something. I'll be anxious to see, speaking of Jumanji, like how much of, how likely is it that the soups that are left in the windowless, doorless room, that this is just Kate holding them? Because that feels pretty likely to me. Ooh, that's a good theory. That's a good theory. Um, I think Kate's trapped them. I don't know that where they are is real. Dang, I didn't <laughs> think about that. Because yeah. it does look like, you know what it looked like to me? Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people have brought up these comparisons because God, you is supposed to be a direct parody of the X-Men, but it looked like the X-Men kind of visuals from yeah but i could see that i i could definitely see that because i think feel like things like andre's there on his phone and emma has her like boba tea or whatever and they're relaxed too right like when marie wakes up she's freaked out but everyone else is, yep we're just here yeah exactly which makes me wonder if they're in some kind of kate construct something or other mind so. palace because we know she does that so We've already seen that she can do that. So, yeah, maybe they like bought hooked her up to a machine that amplifies it, but she's a vegetable or something like that. Or I don't know. Yeah. Kate's messed up at the end. That explosion is really, oh, it's really something. <laughs> like when Marie just yeah. explodes her arm. Wow. Oh, it's something. Like, yeah, the whole finale, like I said, they pack a lot into that time in a way that was really impressive to me. It was a solid end. And one of the other things that I really love, going back to Sam, was the discussion between him and Luke, like imaginary mm -hmm. Luke, in the hallway right before Kate's telling him, I can just make you not feel anything. And I loved that. Luke is sitting there and he's, no, you can be good. I know this. And this interesting, like, play of Sam recognizing that Luke's not real. I just thought that was really interesting. So he knows he's talking to himself and his rejection of his own, like, understanding that he could be good is just 
yeah, again, it's heartbreaking. And mm, I loved it. I thought it was so good. You know what I like about that scene? Is they have a bit of, uh, I don't think it's like a blink and you'll miss it. But every time it's an editing thing, which I really liked, where Sam is talking to Luke. And then it, Kate's perspective, and she's like looking to her right, who are you talking to? I think that was really well done because it shows she doesn't really care about Sam or really understands who he is. Right. Because if she understood who, she, who he is, like Emma does, then maybe she would have been like, oh, okay, here's another way to get him, like under the spell or whatever. Rather than being so confused, I, I thought that was really cool. Yeah, totally. A neat bit of storytelling. Mm -hmm. But what do you think about, we got to talk about Homelander showing up. I think he is terrifying no matter how long he is on screen. <laughs> did you have the same feeling I did? Like when he showed up? Because when he showed up, I'm like, oh, okay, we're good, we're good. Everything's going to be fine. And then I remembered at the same time that he delivers his line of who are you and then calls her a monster. I'm like, oh, the boy scene three. Yeah. Right. <laughs> a monster, an animal. I'm just like, oh, he was, he is so scary. Also, I love the score when he comes in because it's the big, like, majestic music, except it's really discord inverted, and horrible. Oh, it's fantastic. The scoring. There, I'll be honest, I don't notice the score a whole lot in the boys or in Gen V. It's not something that really stands out to me in any kind of particular way. But oh my goodness, Homelander comes flying in. And there's this, yeah, like superhero kind of music. But it, uh, it is really like dissonant and off. Oh, it is so good. Like a hundred points to the score writer on that one. I don't know who's done it, but well, oh, so good. It was a fantastic moment there. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, I, I just thought that was interesting because it, it, it's that moment where you're supposed to be like, oh, this is going to be like the moment where it's like, oh, hey, join the boys or, or join the, yeah. yeah, join the seven. I don't, but yeah, it, it was just this kind of inversion of that, yeah. which I thought was really neat. Let's see. What else didn't we talk about? Oh, I want to talk about two characters real quick. How did you feel about um, Marie's benefactor being, I want to keep trying to say AOC, but yeah, um, <laughs> but no, uh, yeah, Victoria Newman, um, and then like the FBI agent who is in charge of the boys showing up. Yeah. Oh my gosh. What's her name? Mallory. Yeah. Mallory. That's it. The Newman thing. <laughs> Again, that was one of those things. I, I really thought prior to the reveal, I thought Edgar was also behind her, but maybe in a different way, just because we knew that he had been the benefactor for Newman. And so I thought maybe he saw her as somebody who, like, he wasn't able to do with her what he wanted. Here's somebody with similar powers, so it's going to be her. So that was what I thought going in before. It being, again, it being Newman felt... <laughs> It felt more, okay, Newman has to show up so that she can show Marie that her powers are bigger than just, I can shoot blood at people, that it's, I can see things, I can sense things. And I felt like it was a little bit cheap there, so I didn't love that. I personally would have preferred it to be. <laughs> but also, I just want, you know, Juan Carlo and everything. Yeah. Like, just have him show up because I would have preferred him as a cameo. <laughs> It's the Ryan Airy curse. He, he goes all in on one prediction and then it does it it uh, doesn't end up being the case. Uh, what did he say about the hexagons and WandaVision? Uh, oh, I don't remember. I know that. Like that there was something with a beekeeper and that was like the real villain and Mephisto. And, um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I thought that was like, I, I would have preferred it to be Edgar too. Um, because I think that makes more sense because he got shuffled off in season three of the boys. Right on. 
and it feels for someone that big to go away that I feel like either Ashley or Edgar should have been like the person to fill that power vacuum. I think so, personally. Because yeah. let's be honest about Ashley for a second as CEO. I don't think that I don't, I don't, she has survived. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. So I'm surprised she's in, in still in the boys. But anyways, speaking of, I thought the Mallory thing was cheap. Also, yeah, I agree. Yeah. The, so those are the two instances of Key Jang laying out. It's really, just I don't know if I need Mallory, but I do. Yeah. That Mallory explicitly states that hey, you don't want to go without rules because I know somebody who's without rules. For Obviously, me. hinting at Butcher, Butcher but yeah, um, but yeah, I'll be interested uh, to see where that goes. My kid just... literally just texted me while we were recording this. Kripke tweeted or X or whatever. The update editing is done. VFX halfway done. Music and sound quarter done. Now that the SAG strike is over, yay! The actors can record additional dialogue. No air date yet, but will be worth the wait. It could be our best season for sure, our craziest. So, woo, yay. <laughs> and can I make a bold prediction uh, about that? Yes. Because at the time the SAG strike started, the guy who, the actor who plays Butcher, oh gosh. Carl Urban. Carl Urban was off filming like Mortal Kombat 2. I think there might be a delay on season four if he has to go back to filming season, not season two, uh, Mortal Kombat 2, because obviously they're going to require more time of him. And it's not like you can exactly have a, a Prime Video-esque recording boot on the go. <laughs> Yeah, I'll be interested to see what we get. I have, like, fingers crossed that it's the first half of next year anyway. We'll see. Yeah, we're getting Invisible Season 2 Part 2, what, whenever, what did he say, whenever it's finished? So it's, so I, I think I'm applying that mindset. Yeah. With that said, what do you think happens? What do you think the lead-in is for Season 4 of The Boys? That's where the woods matters. Excuse me. Give me a sec. No worries. It's flu season. I get it. That's where the woods, I think, matters the most, is you have this soup virus. I am just super anxious to see what they do with that, because that feels like it has the biggest implications for four, obviously. Yeah, I definitely think that Butcher gets his hands on it through Mallory or something. And... I want to say that uh, I'm trying not to spoil the comic book, too, because I know certain things about Newman that happened in the comic book. Um, I, I think those things will happen in season four. I think it'll be about the political campaign and then also the virus. And then the vi I'm betting that at the end of season four, that virus gets unleashed. And then I that's so. the hander into season two. Jin because that yeah, makes the most sense. Yeah, I agree. I definitely think we're going to have um, the, like, the photo of Homelander standing in the confetti and everything that was released just yesterday definitely indicates we're going to have a have an election here. <laughs> and we know that's coming just from, from the previous season, so that's obviously going to be a big thing. Yeah. That's where, that's where the boys and Gen V most divide is one is far more political and one is a lot more social. And I think that is probably the biggest reason to watch both in my mind. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing is there, I think they tease that Homelander is going to go on trial too. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hashtag home free. <laughs> yeah. You, so you saw that. Okay. <laughs> but gosh, what, what haven't we talked about? I feel like we've covered it. Right? I think most of it, yeah. I, like I said, Shetty is like the other character that we haven't really talked about. And what's his name? Blake? Tech Knight? Oh, Tech Knight. Tech Knight is worth watching if literally only for the vast number of 
whole comments that they make in that whole episode, that entire episode. Oh my goodness. It is so many more, especially when you know the story of him. It is fantastic. It's really funny. <laughs> not, not to mention that the episode title is The Whole Truth. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I guess with that said, yeah, I, I think that's all I have to say about Gen V Season 1. We'll come back next what next year? Yeah. Is it, is it really gonna be next year for the boys? That's so far away. <laughs> for we'll come back and talk about Gen V season four. The boys season four. Uh in 2024, whenever that comes out, I'll make sure to have you on again because that makes the most sense. Uh, also, in terms of TV stuff, I'll have a season one, not season one, season two thing of Loki going up sometime next week with Matthew Simpson on Awesome Friday, who's also one of my patrons. Thank you. But I guess with that said, thank you everyone for listening or watching the Austin B Media podcast. I've been your host, Austin Belzer. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast app or leave a comment in the YouTube video thingy. You can follow me on social media at Austin B Media on Blue Sky, Facebook, Instagram, Mastodon, and Threads. Rip Pebble. On the platform formerly known as Twitter, aka X, uh, you can follow me at Austin B Media underscore. And if you fancy the letterbox, I'm on there as Austin B Movie. Where can uh, people follow you on social media at least? I am most active on threads and Instagram, where I am Elise Ch at Elise Chaffins. And you can find me on TikTok. I do one minute movie reviews there. And that is Elise D. Chaffins because I'm bad at branding. So, yay! <laughs> yeah, I'll make sure to follow you because, or uh, maybe I already do, but I'll, I see the notifications of the one minute. No, that's YouTube. That's where it is. Yeah, I am on YouTube. I think I'm Elise Chaffins on YouTube. Yeah, I'll make sure I'll follow you if I'm not already following you everywhere else. And also, um, in case I didn't already mention it, welcome to Cherry Picks. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was exciting. Uh, that was just a recent thing. Yeah. yeah, I saw that last night, so wanted to mention it. Um, but with that said, I uh, hope you all enjoyed the episode. Um, I'll see you next year for The Boys Season 4. Mm -hmm.